Hi guys. Just a reminder that this podcast, as well as many of my online resources, is delivered freely. If you would like to help me get this message of healing out to millions of people around the world, please consider clicking on the donate button on my website, thecureforchronicpain.com. Thank you. Hello, everybody. How are you today? This is Nicole, and welcome to my podcast, The Cure for Chronic Pain, with me, Nicole Sachs. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Woo, this has been a freaking week. And I'm going to tell you something. Today, I am doing something I've never done before in the millions of years that I've had this podcast, and that's what it feels like forever. And just today. No, I'm just kidding. It feels like forever. Um, I am recording it on the night it will air, hours before it will air, and I never do this. I'm such a planning girl. Um, I like to get things done. I like to have myself sorted. I don't like to stress. I don't like to be last minute. Um, Really, really, really don't like that and never have in the history of this podcast, but the subject of this podcast today is going to be grief and self-care, and it is because I have had a week, more than a week, but weeks of grief and a lot of need for self-care. And part of the self-care is giving myself a break that I didn't record an IGTV video this week. I didn't record a reel. I put a lot of funny crap up on Instagram rather than some like real messages because it's very important to me um, that I give you guys a lot of great content. And listen, the things I put up that aren't great content, at least they're really freaking funny. But um, check out my Instagram, by the way, at Nicole Sachs LCSW if you um, haven't seen it. But in any case, and I and I didn't record this podcast till just now. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the past few weeks of my life and um, and we're going to talk about grief. And we're going to talk about what it really is to feel grief, to grieve, and what it really is that we need in order to grieve properly and what we can do for our children and our loved ones. So that's a really important topic. And just a lot about self-care because self-care is so often giving yourself a break, being able to say no, being able to say, I can be less than perfect right now, being able to just say, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to show up can't do it. So I think it's really, really important. Uh, Before we go into that, I just want to tell you guys quickly about the Curable app. It is a sponsor of this podcast. It is a wonderful app. I often say I cannot do this by myself. I can't be the only one carrying this message. And I know I'm not the only one at all. There are definitely a lot of us out here trying to carry the message of mind-body medicine, but Curable is an app that you can access any time of the day or night. It does a fantastic job of explaining the brain science between TMS and, in general, the mind-body connection. It has guided meditations. It has awesome interviews and readings and writing assignments. Every couple times a year, they have these curable groups where you can get together with other people that are suffering and that are healing and that are working so hard just like you and create community and really learn. And I just can't say enough about the curable app. It's used by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And over 80% say that they have a reduction in pain symptoms after one month of using it. So it's just really, really a fantastic tool, and I highly recommend it. And since you are a listener of my podcast and part of my family, you can get 50% off the Curable app for the first year by going to www.getcurable.com slash Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, 50% off the first year of Curable. Really awesome deal. Really worth it. If you want to take this work to the next level, Curable can really, really do that for you. I highly believe in it and um, and check it out. Other than that, let's see. This is going to air on uh, early Friday morning on the East Coast. Um, It'll be well into the day in Europe um, by the time it – and on Australia – by the time it airs, and we have one week, one week, one week in a couple days until I will be teaching at the Omega Institute. It is going to be incredible. I am not saying that with hyperbole. It's going to be fucking awesome. It will change your life. Everyone there, and if you're listening and you're coming, my God, get excited. You will not be the same person when you leave. I will personally 
make sure of that. I am so pumped. So from the bottom of my heart pumped. Anyway, so if you can manage it, click the link in my the retreats tab on my website, thecureforchronicpain.com. Come learn with us. Come grow with us. Come love with us. It's going to be incredible. The Omega Institute is like the most incredible summer camp for grownups, farm to table organic food, awesome cabins and hiking trails and a lake and just it's beautiful. And the experience of the retreat will be beautiful. And we have the most incredible room, the main hall, right in the center of campus. So, um, And if you do have mobility issues, they will cart you around in a golf cart from door to door, anywhere you need to be. They're really, really awesome about accessibility. So go to my website, click on the retreats tab, join us. You have one week to sign up. Okay, let's talk about grief. So. Um, One thing about grief is that I think it is an event that makes your nervous system feel like you're being attacked because um, most of the time when you are in a state of grieving, you are not expecting it. And this doesn't mean that you didn't consciously know. You know, sometimes if someone's dying slowly and then they die, you might say, well, I should have known that this grief was coming. You know, I I knew it was happening. I, I, I watched this person become sicker and sicker. But there's something about the nervous system that I believe holds out hope that you'll get one more day until you don't. And, um, and that kind of a loss – gives a jolt to the nervous system like you're being attacked. And I and and I am in a situation where I experienced a sudden loss. Um so those of you who aren't following me on Instagram or on Facebook may not know this, but um if you have heard about the Miami Tower collapse at Surfside, Florida, um my very very dear friend Teresa Velasquez and um both of her parents were in their apartment sleeping peacefully and they all lost their lives in that collapse. And so ever since the day that happened, I have been in such a state of grief and it's and and I and I kind of feel like what I was saying where I didn't I went from fear and uncertainty and um and sort of a terror, a feeling of terror that something that random could happen to then when they their bodies were identified to going into grief and it feels like you're being attacked it feels so um it just feels at least for me it felt like something i was so unprepared for that um i i wasn't able to have peace in the day or in the night i mean it would be in my dreams it was in my every thought um you know at first it was are they okay and then it was after that it was you know just mourning this incredible loss so um so it's been an interesting process and you know we're always talking about brain science on this podcast we're always talking about the interaction between the brain and the nervous system and I think grief is really an interesting one because I think that um at least for me grief feels really bottomless it feels like how could you possibly feel it all you know it just it feels so so vast and and it doesn't have to just be grief when someone dies you know I'm I'm watching my son right now go through extended grief through a breakup. He was 16 years old. He was super in love and, um, and she broke up with him. You know, she had her reasons. I don't really understand them. It doesn't, it's not for me to understand. He doesn't really understand them, but, um, and I'm watching his grief and I'm watching his nervous system feel like it was attacked and him getting a lot of physical symptoms of nausea and inappetence. And he threw up once and, he just felt a lot of fatigue and you know that's what grief does to us it can manifest really physically as well as emotionally as well as in that kind of heart palpitating fight or flight feeling as if one was being attacked or being threatened because i think all of the um protective systems in our brain and our nervous system go on high alert when we're grieving because we're we're trying to protect ourselves from all sides <clears throat> excuse me so that um, that really, really affected me. That really affected him. And so however you may be grieving, 
however you may be finding yourself, whatever loss, maybe you've lost a job for COVID, during COVID, maybe you lost a friendship or a relationship, maybe you had a death that you you know are dealing with. And also, let's talk about repressed grief for a moment. Sometimes um, when you have a loss, you're just not capable of handling the emotions of it at the time. You just you just stuff it down. You repress the feelings. You kind of you know shake yourself off and say you'll go on. That stuff can come back to haunt you. And if you don't know how important it is to feel things, to really pause and feel through your feelings, then that can get stuck in your body. That's where, you know, the body keeps the score and we can start feeling physical stuff as a manifestation of our grief. And actually one person that really spoke beautifully about that on the podcast, if you go back to my episode with Ricky Lake, her um, husband took his life and she was in such grief for so long and just couldn't bear, couldn't bear to go there, couldn't bear to feel it. And you know what? Sometimes that's a choice. Sometimes you say, you know what? This is too much for me. It hurts worse to feel it. I'm going to, I'm going to take a beat. I'm not going to, I'm not going to feel into it. And, and Ricky did that for a while until she just felt like she couldn't anymore. And um, the what the catalyst that f- made her feel like she couldn't anymore, she got terrible sciatica. And she got such bad sciatica, she could barely walk. She was considering using a wheelchair in the airport. And um, finally, I said to her, I go, honey, I think you're feeling Christian's death in your down your leg. And she was like, how can that be? And I said, because that's how this works. And she started a journal speak practice. And of course, the sciatica went away completely and she's not gotten it back since. And so um, so this is real stuff, guys. Grief is, a, grief is a major emotion. It's an attack. It's an assault on the system. Because like I said, even if we should, if we intellectually think we could be expecting something, even if it's not a sudden, sudden loss like my friend Teresa, um, it's still something that your nervous system does not prepare itself for until it happens. And I think anybody who's gone through real grief is is nodding their head because, you know, I, I remember when my friend Meredith's father was dying of cancer and he he died for, for years, two or three years. He, he went into remission and then he got cancer somewhere else. And even when he was in the ICU and I remember going there to visit him, I felt like the family just, um, they weren't ready to feel it until he actually went. And then it felt like everybody was, you know, was under attack. They were all having their different reactions to it. Some angry, some sobbing, some, you know, oh, I'm relieved it's fine now, sort of denial kind of stuff. So um, I don't know. I just want to make a really, really open space, a wide, wide road for us to walk down however grief is affecting you. And just kind of use this podcast to call to attention how important it is to feel things, how important it is to feel things if you are ready to feel things, if you can. And if you can't and you could manage the headaches or the stomach issues or the fibromyalgia, you know, flare-ups, if if that almost feels easier than feeling your grief, then that's okay. That's the thing, guys. It's not that pain is, is such an enemy. Pain is information. Pain is energy. It's an energy transfer. So if we can feel it through our emotions, we can feel it there. And sometimes if we don't have that kind of ability, we can feel it in our bodies. And, you know, most people that come to me are just sick of feeling it in their bodies. They are. They're like, I am ready to feel. So so I want to say something about um, Teresa's funeral. So I can't even imagine what kind of dissociation her brother David had to be in to do what he did. And I'm not saying that as a criticism to him at all. I'm saying that like, I don't know if how a human being could stand on, um, on a stage and to 300 people eulogize their mother, their father, and their little sister. Um, he lost his entire nuclear family in one day. I'd say he is in his late 30s. He has a wife, uh, she is pregnant, and he has a three-year-old son. They have a three-year-old son. So um, so he was looking out upon all these people, and he gave a whole beautiful eulogy, first about his father, then about Teresa, and then he finished up with his mother. And at the very end of the eulogy, 
he said he, – he had it all written down. He said, well, I'm going to go off script for a second. And he told the story. And he said that the last time he and his wife and son FaceTimed with Teresa and their parents was about a week prior to the collapse when Teresa was visiting them in their apartment. And I guess they were um, trying to make Zane laugh. And they were a very, very joyous family. And so they put, they threw a green towel over um, her dad's head and they put sunglasses on him. So he looked kind of like a bizarre green ghost. And Teresa, um, who was a drummer, always had her bongos. And she was playing the bongos and like kind of dancing around and playing the bongos. And her dad was just dancing around, like bopping his head like this weird, odd ghost guy. And um, and her mom was just laughing. And Zane on FaceTime up in New York was just rolling with laughter. So David is explaining this, just this beautiful moment of connection with a family. And then he said, and I'm going to try to get it right. He said, what I've learned through this gut-wrenching experience that I have lived through in the past few weeks is that you could never prepare a child for grief by exposing them to grief. You prepare a child for grief by cultivating and maintaining for them a deep reservoir of joy and love. And his family was joy and love. So I don't know, maybe he wasn't totally dissociated. Maybe he really truly had such a deep reservoir of joy and love that he was able to deliver that eulogy and to stand up in front of all those people having lost three of the most important people in his life. But wow, did that moment really get me. It really got me. It was, I was really, really emotional at that moment because it was such truth to me. It was such truth to me that that is what it, that's what it is, guys. If we want to endure and feel and prepare ourselves for grief, because life is full of grief. There's always loss. That's part of the human condition. There's no way around it. We must relentlessly seek to cultivate and maintain for ourselves a deep reservoir of joy and love and connection and relationship. That's the way we prepare ourselves for grief. And I think that, you know, especially when you've gotten older and maybe you haven't gotten what you've ne you needed from your own parents, really cultivating self-love, really working on self-compassion, doing it intentionally, doing it like it's your job. You know, I, I have a whole half day at Omega that we do self-compassion work and it's not just like, oh, yay, affirmations, I'm going to try to feel good about myself. This is really core work. This is rewiring your neural pathways so when you go into a stressful situation, your first reaction is not to criticize yourself or put yourself down. Your first reaction is to be compassionate and supportive of yourself and cultivate this deep reservoir of joy and love and connection. We can do this for ourselves, guys. I know it sounds hard and it sounds hard to believe, but I have watched people change dramatically from doing this kind of work. For, for pausing and reminding ourselves, if I wouldn't talk to my dearest friend or child or pet this way, then I cannot talk this way to myself. You're stupid. You're a failure. You're fat. You're ugly. Why can't you just? You should be this. You're always doing this wrong. I mean, imagine if you spoke to someone, your dearest love, like that. But we do it to ourselves all the time. So do I all the time. So this is not to shame you. This is not to tell you you're doing it wrong. It's to tell you that it's worthwhile to stay awake. It's worthwhile to stay awake and aware and spacious and know that the way we talk to ourselves matter because it's oh grief is always lurking. There's so many reasons to to have to grieve and that and and we need to be realistic about that. What happened for me with my Teresa was as unexpected as they come. 
36 years old in the prime of her life. And when I say prime of her life, this girl was a badass. Google Teresa Velasquez. She's just, first of all, she's gorgeous and shiny and loving, the kindest, most open-hearted person you've ever met. I am telling you, I I don't even I I can't believe that there are people like her. Everywhere she goes, all she wants to do is help. All she wants to do is be of service. She was so kind, so loving, so willing to give of herself. And and that's why she was so beloved. And so if 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 that can happen, that kind of crazy grief, and, and I've felt it this week, the last few weeks. How can I be present enough to talk with you guys here? And it's because Teresa, in her love for me and her friends and her family, did cultivate that deep reservoir of joy and love. She really did. I have it. So even though I've lost her, it's like really hard to just be sad because I'm so full of gratitude for having known her. And, and I just think it's so important that we can be mindful and think about how to cultivate this in our own lives. And maybe when we think about what we're grieving, you know, I know when you're in the throes of it, this isn't possible, but any chance you can, even if it's just for a moment, if you're able to look at the positives of the situation to honor the time you had with that person or with that job or with that animal or, you know, in that relationship, even if it ended, anything you can do to bring yourself into the space of joy and love and connection, it's worth it. It's worthwhile because I do think that if we just stay in the part of loss, in the part of the negativity, we, we're not giving ourselves that reservoir that we need. And let me just quickly say, because I know that I'm the queen of journal speak here, I'm not saying to repress your feelings. If you're feeling like everything sucks, it's never going to get better, you know, you've been betrayed, you've been decimated, take it to your journal speak. Tell the truth. Yes, yes, yes. Tell the truth. Never suppress and repress that stuff. But when you get, not but, and when you get the opportunity to build that reservoir. Just remember how important it is. And sometimes I think my work is is always just to state the obvious. Because I mean, anybody, it's not like I'm, I'm doing rocket science here, like Jeff Bezos, wink, wink. Um, <laughs> I was going to say something off color and I'm not going to say it, but if you were thinking that off color thing, you know what I was about to say. Anyway, I know this isn't rocket science. I, I know that what I'm saying is pretty obvious, but what I think is that people forget the obvious, the simple obvious stuff that changes lives more profoundly than the more complicated stuff. And the simple obvious stuff to pause and to not talk to yourself like you're the, you're the most hated enemy you have, to pause and to take care of yourself. So let's talk about take self-care for a minute. I am a recovering perfectionist. I'm a person who feels like I have to do a good job that I so, so badly want to help. I so, so badly want you to feel better. Um, I want to be seen as a good person. I want to be um, thought of as someone who has beautiful motives all the time. It kills me to be misunderstood. I hate being disliked. I'm working on this. I'm working on this because I know that not everyone's going to like me and that's totally reasonable for me to be okay with it. And so I'm working on it. But I'm just telling you like that kind of stuff can really get in the way of cultivating this joy and love that we need. And so a lot of what I've done in the past few weeks is is cancel plans um, kindly, of course, and with honesty. I don't lie. I really rarely, rarely lie. I, lying makes me feel like shit, so I don't just I just don't do it. I tell the truth. I say, listen, like I had to cancel an appointment this morning. And I was like, listen, I'm having this thing with my daughter. I mean, my life has been one thing after another. Not to complain, but I could complain. Um, and, you know, I, I just said I'm not in the space to to do what we were going to do. I, it wouldn't be a good mental space for me right now. And she said, I totally understand. I didn't have to make up an excuse and lie, and neither do you. You are as important as every other person in the situation. Your feelings are as important. Your opinion is as important. And so if you're in a situation where – Self-care means that you have to back out of something. Just tell the truth. 
you have a right to how you feel. And so, you know, I, like I said, you know, I've been kind of half-assing it on my Instagram, which I never do, just in the times where I had to make content in advance. And when you have to make content in advance that's produced, I just didn't have the time. And so I just said it. And you know what? I almost think people appreciate my honesty when, I, when I'm unable to deliver as much as they appreciate when I deliver, if not more. And so just remember that. Remember that, that we're, we're all grieving in our, in our own ways. A million little deaths, deaths inside our hearts of what we wanted the day to be, what we wanted our, our life to be by the time we were blankety blank, whatever age you are, you know, constantly reliving the past and all those death by a thousand paper cuts, we're all grieving. And so allowing that space, that spaciousness to just be present and know when it's too much, when we need to just say, nope, I'll take the headache today. I don't want to think about it. And just try to take as good a care of yourself as you can. And some days when you're like, you know what? I don't want the headache anymore. It's enough. I'm going to get to my journal speak. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to write a letter. God, I'm realizing right now I need to write a letter to Teresa. I do. We need to talk. I'm going to write a letter. I'm going to write a letter to somebody that I wish I could talk to that I can't anymore. I'm going to tell them all the things, the good and the bad. I'm going to share my heart knowing that I'm not going to send it. Writing the letter that you'll never send is such a therapeutic exercise because it really allows you to fully, fully express yourself without fearing whatever retribution would come or, of course, in the space when somebody's passed away where you can't send it to them. It really does your heart so much good. You know, because all these weeks I've been missing her and I've been in such shock that this all happened and I really want to talk to my friend and I can still do that. You guys can do that too. So um, so I'm off to bring my daughter to camp this weekend. I'm hoping it goes smoothly. You remember my daughter, um, Charlotte, has had some anxiety in the past, so it's a little stressful to bring her to camp. She wanted to go. I thought she will never go away from home again, and I was fine with it. Whatever she wanted, she begged to go. So we're going to camp this weekend, and then um, – I'll come home and I'll do my final prep for Omega. So um, so I'm off to do that. I, I hope you guys all have a good weekend. I hope this podcast was okay. I'm so tired. It's 10, 18 at night. This will air in three hours. <laughs> so when you're listening to that, especially, this especially over in um, Australia and Asia and uh, Europe and Africa and, and anybody who's listening to me out there in these other time zones, like <laughs> – I just went to bed. <laughs> this is me right now. It's, it's almost like I'm live. Um, so I, I hope this. Um, I hope this gave you something. You know, I just didn't want to not show up. I didn't want to not show up, so I showed up imperfect. And I would really invite you to do the same. Show up as the beautiful mess that you are. God, do people appreciate it? God, do I appreciate it when people do that? So try it out. Try it out. I think it feels kind of good. And remember, if you do want to take advantage of Curable's awesome, deep 50% off discount, just go to getcurable.com slash Nicole, www.getcurable.com slash N-I-C-O-L-E. And if you want to come study with me at Omega and spend the whole week with me, goofball me, being totally authentic, but you know what? I'm really ready for that. That won't be ad-libbing. I got some pretty serious stuff to teach you there. Just go over to the retreats tab of my website, thecureforchronicpain.com. I love you guys. I really do. I appreciate you. I appreciate you showing up every week. Look at us. We're just hanging out together every week. If you're, if you're enjoying this podcast, if you could go over to iTunes and rate and review it, it is such a great service to me and I appreciate it and I love reading what you have to say. All right, guys. It's been a pleasure being with you today. This is Nicole Sachs. And until next time, this has been The Cure for Chronic Pain. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.